Three. Josiah, I'm going to have you uh, play a little bit of music in a minute. We have several other worship opportunities tonight. Uh, we'll introduce them in just a minute. First Thessalonians, I just want to teach you. First, I'm going to talk to you about prayer. Why pray and why fast? So first, I'm going to talk to you about prayer. Then we're going to pray. And uh, it's already been one of the things, uh, the song that Josiah just did is that he's a miracle worker. Uh, I, I refused to put this week when I, I posted, we're believing God for miracles. I didn't do that. I said, we're seeing miracles. Amen. It's kind of like the song we did last week, uh, you know, waiting on a move. We're in a move. Yeah. You, you got to put yourself in it. You know, uh, today we're at the hospital with this with folk. We've already seen miracles. We've seen God do great things already. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 3, and you got to understand his heart toward the churches. How much he loved the church at Thessalonica and, and Corinth and, and uh, other places. He just had a, a, the, the church at Philippi. He had, a, he had a heart for those churches. And, and, and he will, you'll pick it up in his writings in just a couple of verses here, 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 7. So we have been greatly encouraged in the midst of our troubles and suffering. Encouraged in troubles and suffering. Encouraged in troubles and suffering. Dear brothers and sisters, because you have remained strong in your faith. In other words, when my troubles came, I was encouraged because I saw you staying strong. It gives us new life to know that you are standing firm in the Lord. How we thank God for you. Because of you, we have great joy as we enter God's presence. Paul said, night and day, we pray earnestly for you, asking God to let us see you again, to fill the gaps in your faith. When I read this, I'm picking up on something. First, prayer is not everything, but everything is by prayer. You know, prayer may not be everything, but everything has to become by prayer. All believers have to agree with that. And no matter what your background is, instinctively, we know prayer is essential in our life. And by the way, those that could be watching on HolyWild.tv, just welcome to a prayer service. We're going to be worshiping and praying tonight and believing God for great things. And we all know we ought to pray. We all feel we should pray more than we do. And life can change so quickly. That's why we got to stay on, on it. Life changes quickly. The, vo the phone rings, and the voice says, I've got bad news, and then you hear it, and you know it. And sometimes that's you making that phone call. You know, so here's some ways when Paul mentions in verse 10. He said, night and day we pray. Now, let me just mention this. I I'm not throwing Paul under the bus, but this is a hyperbole. Paul, you don't have time to pray 24 hours a day. It doesn't happen. But what he's saying is, I remember you. Hyperbole is an exaggeration for effect. Uh, I've used them my whole life. Some people say, now, you're just lying. No. Uh, if you're black and white, I guess you could say that. But the bottom line is, I use hyperbole as exaggerations for effect. I, I want to affect something. Uh, now, I'm careful with the number of people in the house. But, but as a rule, I, I do use hyperboles. Most, and so he said, night and day, I, we pray earnestly, most earnestly, that we may see you again and supply what is lacking. So we're just going to break this verse down and then go right into prayer. What was lacking is prayer was constant. He said, I keep remembering you, night and day. I keep remembering you. Paul says he prayed this way. When he, you know, when was the last time you lost sleep because God put somebody on your mind? Amen. And you just woke up. That's that night and day. That's that moment when you're, somebody enters your dream life and you go, whoa, hang on. And you wake up and you vividly remember them. You remember seeing them in your dream. And I've had such an incredible life that there's so many people that I've had in my dreams. Uh, I'll have people that you think, there's no way you got them. Yeah, they're, they're in my dreams, man. I think about them. I pray for them. And when I get that, it's important. So first, his prayer was constant. Second, his prayer was earnest. Prayer must be earnest to be effective. What you find in life is weak, shallow, half-hearted prayers produce weak, shallow, half-hearted results. The Scripture says here, an effective, fervent prayer James talking, an effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, that word fervent in the Greek is boiling, is boiling. And you don't know what boiling is until you get the phone call that your son's being life flighted, mm. until your son has, has fallen and, and, and hurt himself, cracked his skull, until, until there's a fever rising in your daughter to 104, 105. Now you're boiling. Now your prayer's getting fervent. Now you're getting, you're getting possessive with, with the uh, presence of God. You want him to look you in the face while you talk to him. That's that effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person. Amen. It avails much. It does something. His prayer was practical. He said he was praying that we may see you again. There are times in life you will leave somebody and you'll say, you know what? That might be the last time I get to talk to them. I, I saw Diana Nash's car pull up uh, next door to the property. Well, I called Don Nash because last time this happened, he snuck up on me. 
So I called him on his cell phone. He didn't answer. So I called him on his home phone. I only, two pe- I only know two people in life that's got a home phone, Don Nash and my mom. So I called him on his home phone, and he answered. I said, never mind. That answered my question. You're not here. You're still in Arkansas. But I think of Don Alton. He's been a good friend of mine. And, and so I, I pray for him. I lift him up. I want to see you again. The, there are times when somebody departs from your life, you you may never see him again. So Paul's prayer was that, that way. And do you pray about stuff like that every day? Uh, if, if, you, if you're in sales, should, should you pray about your appointments? If you're a doctor, amen, you've you got to pray for your patients. We were at the hospital today and visiting with Pat uh, Curtis. And Pat's son has gone into a medical field. His, her daughter's in the medical field. You know, if, if I'm in the medical field, I, one of the things that I'm praying for people, I thank God for surgeons that pray. That will see that it's God that's got the hand on them, you know, that, that's helping them find what is wrong. So if you're a doctor, you would pray. If you're a teacher, you've got to pray for your students. If, you, if you're working in an office, you've got to pray for your work, uh, fellow workers. And nothing's too small to bring to God's attention if it matters to you. Now, if it don't matter to you, don't bring it. But if it matters to you, you can bring it to his attention. Number four here, prayer is purposeful. Paul had a particular goal in mind. He wanted to supply what was lacking in their faith. He wanted to supply what was lacking in their faith. When you see people at times, you say, they something missing in their life. Amen. God, help me see. I don't have to talk to them, but help me see what it is that's missing. Amen. Is it a relational issue? Is it a financial issue? Is it, it, what is it that's missing in their life? Is it a self-esteem they're fighting with? God, do they understand you as their, their provider? And God, do they realize how special you are to them? Do, do, have they picked up on that? So when Paul prayed this way, he, he said, God, what I really want here is for you to supply what was lacking in their faith. The word supply was used for mending, torn nets, and setting broken bones. Supply was for mending broken nets, just like in the book of Ephesians where he talks about the, the ministry was to help equip people for the saints, to help equip people uh, for the ministry. The word equip there is the same thought here. It means to supply. It means to give people the valuable tools. And one of the things I'm looking for more this year is the, what I call the pearls and the pews. I know there are singers out there. I know there are musicians. I know there are children's workers. I know there are, are, are people that can work with our youth ministry. I know there are people that can play music. It's just finding them and finding the right one and trying to help them understand that it may not be the time yet. May, the timing may not be there yet. But when it is, you know, and to be able to encourage people to step out and do what God has called you maybe to do. When I, when I read this, I, I'm, I'm praying. I'm praying here, and again, the Scripture supply mending torn nets and setting broken bones. We pray that that which is fractured tonight, we're going to pray that, but that which is fractured, whether it is a relationship, that it can be mended. Some of you, I know, think it'll never happen. They'll never get back together. And they'll never be friends again. The dad and, and daughter are, are separated forever. I, I don't, I'm just going to sit here and disagree with you. Yeah. I believe that God can mend. Uh, yeah. I was with Denise Nicholson today, me and the guys, and praying with her. And, of course, you know, Denise went through the trauma of the, of the, the, the cutting and the beating and the shooting and all the things that happened to her last week. It was just heartbreaking. But she's talking. But last night she talked to me on the phone, and she said, Pastor, sometimes you've got to go down for other people to come up. And I'm listening to her talking. I mean, this is a valuable point. And she said, my dad and my sister have been uh, separated for years. My sister got things in her head that somehow dad loved me more, and things like that. So, so for years, they haven't talked. Well, since this happened to me, my sister has come from Alabama with a banjo on her knee. Amen. And she's come and she's visited with my dad, and they're restoring their relationship, and things are pulling back together. Yeah. She said, my, my, my going down in this thing, in this fight, has brought them up. And I thought, now that is supplying a need. That's taking care of things. I've asked Sister Diane to pray with us tonight. Amen. Pray for us and get us started. Then Rich is going to bring the lights down some. Then I want you to find a place to pray. We're going to take us just until God says move and change it up. And then we'll have a, a, a little worship time again, a little video to worship too, because I really like what I've been seeing. Sister Diane, would you come? Good, good word, Pastor. Good word. Holy Spirit, help, help us pray. Help us pray, please. <clears throat> Father, I'm reminded in your word tonight that we're not orphans. 
that we were bought with a price, God. And that you've allowed us and told us, because of Jesus, we can come boldly into your throne of grace, knowing that you hear and answer our petitions, God. Knowing that you care about the things that we care about, God. I'm reminded in Psalms, you tell us that you incline your ear to the righteous, God. And we thank you for that tonight. Father, I take authority over every hindering spirit tonight that would come against this corporate prayer, God. I bind it in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God, for showering boldness down on us tonight, God, in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Speak through your people tonight, God. Speak into existence your perfect will tonight, God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God. Amen.